This video will take a look at a radio receiver I recently picked up and restored, an AGS-38. I acquired this radio as part of an estate auction of vintage radios and electronics. I wasn't familiar with the brand AGS and very little information could be found on the internet. I was able to find out that AGS, or American General Supply of Canada Limited, was a Canadian company that sold tubed CB radios in the 1960s and multiband portable transistor receivers and car 8-track players in the 1970s imported from Japan. They were a distributor for Toshiba, TIAC, and TRIO. They apparently had offices in Montreal and Toronto. The radio receiver nameplate refers to the company as American General Trading Company Limited and says made for AGS in Japan. I wasn't able to find any technical information on this model until I found someone on a forum who noted that it's virtually identical to the Lafayette HA63. Lafayette was a seller of electronics from the 1930s to early 1980s, most notably CB radio equipment. They had a chain of stores similar to Radio Shack, and most of their products were manufactured in Japan. A comparison of the two radios shows that they're almost identical right down to the styling of the cabinet, knob, style, and paint. I was able to identify a few differences between the AGS and Lafayette. The Lafayette HA63 has the headphone jack in the center of the front panel rather than at the left. The AGS has a power switch on the right, while the Lafayette controlled power using the mode switch. The Lafayette also had an S-meter zero control in the back, as well as a fuse holder, both of which the AGS lacks. The band coverage is slightly different. For example, the Lafayette tunes to 31 MHz, but the AGS goes to 30 MHz. And there are also minor circuit and component value differences between the two. My guess is that both radios were manufactured by the same supplier in Japan and branded as either Lafayette or AGS. Lafayette didn't have any stores in Canada, so AGS would not have directly competed with them. The Lafayette HA63 was sold from 1963 to 1966, so this radio would have been of the same era. I found a 1966 Lafayette catalog that lists it for $49.95 and says save $10. They also sold the matching HE48A speaker for $7.95. The radio is a four-band communications receiver. The four bands cover band A from 0.55 to 1.6 MHz, the AM broadcast band, band B 1.6 to 4.8 MHz shortwave, band C 4.8 to 14.5 MHz shortwave, and band D 10.5 to 30 MHz shortwave. It can receive AM, or with the BFO enabled, CW, Morse code, or single sideband signals. There's a 50 to 75 ohm antenna input which can be balanced or unbalanced. Audio output is 1.5 watts into an 8 ohm speaker. There's no internal speaker. It features slide rule tuning with a separate electrical band spread control, a selectable automatic noise limiter, fixed BFO, and a small S meter. It uses seven vacuum tubes and a solid state diode. It runs on 110 to 117 volts AC, 50 to 60 cycles, and takes 50 watts. It's housed in a steel cabinet and weighs about 16 pounds. The Lafayette HA63 lists the sensitivity as 1 microvolt for a 10 dB signal to noise ratio and selectivity of 10 kilohertz, so I imagine this radio would have similar specs. The top of the rear panel is open, but no hazardous voltages are exposed. At left are terminals for antenna and ground, or for a balanced antenna like a dipole. When using an unbalanced antenna like a long wire, one of the antenna terminals is connected to the ground terminal. What looks like an AC outlet is the remote socket. You can switch the receiver on and off from a transmitter or transmit receive switch by connecting contacts to this socket. The receiver will be put in standby mode when the TR switch opens the contacts. As shipped from the factory, there's a jumper wire internally connected across these contacts so that the radio works without a TR switch. A common modification for the Lafayette version of the receiver was to rewire the socket to be an AC outlet accessory socket, so be aware of that if you restore one of these radios. The two terminals on the right are for an 8 ohm loudspeaker. No internal speaker was provided, which was a common way to reduce the cost of these radios. At right is the AC line cord, which was ungrounded, and unlike the Lafayette version of the radio, there's no fuse. The front panel controls include the dial, which is marked in frequency for each of the four bands. 
Note that it's marked megacycles as the term megahertz was not yet used at that time. The 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10 meter amateur radio bands are highlighted as well as a logging scale. A small S meter behind the dial indicates signal strength from 0 to 9 and higher in red. The band spread dial is marked from 0 to 100. When set to 100, the main dial indicates the actual frequency, and when the band spread dial is turned, it subtracts from the frequency on the main indicator. The band spread is not calibrated in any particular units. At bottom is the power switch. Above is the switch to select automatic volume control AVC or manual volume control MVC. The nomenclature is a little unusual as this is usually just referred to as AVC on or off. The S meter only operates when AVC is on. At far left is a switch for the automatic noise limiter ANL, a simple diode type circuit which reduces loud noise peaks such as those caused by car ignition systems. Below that is a quarter inch mono headphone jack for low impedance headphones. The external loudspeaker is switched off when the headphones are connected. The function switch has three positions, rec for normal receiving, send puts the receiver in standby mode such as when using a transmitter, BFO turns on the beat frequency oscillator in order to receive CW, Morse code, or single sideband signals. Note that the BFO frequency is fixed, so you need to adjust the band spread tuning control to adjust the pitch of the signal. AF gain adjusts the audio gain or volume. The antenna trim control is adjusted for maximum signal strength and needs to be adjusted whenever the frequency is changed by a significant amount. The band switch selects from one of the four bands A through D. The main tuning control adjusts the frequency on the main dial. The band spread tuning control is used for fine tuning of the frequency and is generally needed on the short wave bands. The manual suggests it can be used in one of two ways. If you set the main tuning dial to the extreme right hand side of an amateur radio band with the band spread dial set to 100, you can tune over the band selected using the band spread tuning control. Alternatively, you can center the band spread at 50 and use it as a fine tuning control to move up or down. The circuit's a pretty standard superhead design with an RF amplifier using seven tubes. The tube lineup is a 6BA6 RF amplifier, a 6BE6 mixer, a 6BE6 HF local oscillator, a 6BA6 IF amplifier, a 6AV6 detector, AVC, ANL, and first audio amplifier, a 6AV6 BFO, and a 6AR5 audio output amplifier. The power supply uses a transformer and a single silicon diode and is filtered using two electrolytic caps contained in one can. There are two pilot lamps which illuminate the dial. Fortunately these are working as it looks like the dial needs to be disassembled to get at them. The small S meter is run off of the AVC voltage. It uses a 455 kHz IF frequency with two IF transformers. At the top is the large 3 gang main tuning capacitor and smaller 3 gang band spread tuning capacitors. These are controlled by the tuning knobs using dial cord and pulleys. Underneath the chassis, the circuit is all point-to-point -point using tube sockets and terminal strips. The tuned circuits have a number of capacitors and inductors which need to be adjusted during alignment. Let's take a look at the unit in operation. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of activity these days on the shortwave broadcast bands other than amateur radio, and reception is best at night. Here I'm picking up the three local AM broadcast band stations on band A. On band B, I can pick up the time station CHU at 3.33 megahertz. Could be 
As received, the radio looked complete but was very dusty inside and out. It came with no manual and no speaker, but it did come with a hunk of wire that must have been used as an antenna. I gave it a light cleaning and then a visual inspection. There were no obvious missing or bad parts and it looked for the most part unmodified. There was some rust on the front panel and more on the chassis, but overall not too bad for a radio that's over 55 years old. It appears that the power switch may have been replaced as it was soldered, not very professionally, to the power wires and covered in electrical tape which had come off. I resoldered the wires and covered the joints with heat shrink tubing. Some of the knob set screws had these screw slots crumbling so I couldn't easily get them off for cleaning. One resistor looked slightly charred but was still within the current value so I didn't yet replace it. I connected a speaker and powered it up slowly with a variac. I was not surprised to hear a lot of hum indicating that the power supply filter caps were bad, but I did hear some local AM stations which was a good sign that it was mostly working. I replaced the two large filter caps in the power supply by disconnecting the wires to the original CAN capacitor which I left in place and wiring the new smaller caps to existing terminal strips. Just to be sure I also replaced the only other electrolytic cap in the audio output amplifier. I normally also replace any wax paper capacitors in older radios, but this unit doesn't have any. Powering it up again, the hum was gone and it was working on all bands. I did some cleaning of switch contacts and lubricating of controls. The next step was to perform an alignment. I have been able to find a copy of the operating manual for the Lafayette HA63, which included a schematic and alignment information. While there are some circuit differences, they're minor and the alignment procedure was valid for this radio. Alignment requires an RF signal generator and AC voltmeter. I used my Rigol oscilloscope which has a suitable signal generator built in and used the scope in place of an AC voltmeter. I also used an external step attenuator to reduce the signal generator output level. The alignment procedure is long but straightforward. You first peak the two IF transformers with the oscillator tube removed using a signal at 455 kHz. You then adjust the BFO frequency to be centered at 455 kHz by listening for a zero beat. RF alignment requires 18 steps to calibrate the lower and upper ends of each of the four bands plus peak the RF coils and caps. You have to iterate a few times to get the lower and upper band positions to be correct. The radio was reasonably close to being aligned and just needed to be touched up. This was a mid-range radio that was suitable for shortwave listening and with patience, amateur radio. If you look at the extent of the marking for the 40 meter ham band at 7 megahertz, you can see how crowded the stations would be and how hard it would be to tune to a given frequency with any accuracy. In the 1950s and 60s, many young hams saved up enough money to buy a radio like this. The $49.95 cost in 1966 is equivalent to about $400 today. For Morse code reception, selectivity could be improved with the use of an external Q multiplier, such as one of the two Heathkit units I've covered in other videos. The Osterman book Shortwave Receivers Past and Present lists the Lafayette HA63 as scarce, so this AGS branded version of the radio must be quite rare indeed but there are references to a few units on the internet. In summary, this is an interesting and rare radio. I would be interested in hearing from anyone else who owns one of these or any radio made by AGS.